And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest trash fire, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest and craziest ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, among, among a monk of other things, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer here in the temple. Some of you may know him as the... <laughs> As War as Warren Vidic from uh, from the original Assassin's Creed, some of you may know him from his from his work from an innumerable amount of amount of stage and screen, and some of you may even know him all the all the way back of of the mem of a member of Firesign Theater, the one and only Philip Proctor. How are you doing tonight, well, man? <clears throat> I'm fine, but there's actually <clears throat> there's actually at least three mm -hmm. Phil Proctors that I I know <laughs> I know two Phil Proctors. Personally, here in Los Angeles area, <clears throat> one of them was the publicist for the uh, Center Theater Group mm -hmm. when I was performing down there when I first came out here in the <clears throat> late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, his name was Phil Proctor. And another one is a stage manager out at a, 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 a theater, Loyola University or something like that. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm not the one and only. <clears throat> I'm just the, the only. Tonight yeah. I'm the only. <laughs> The lonely. Yeah, and I, I ended up I ended up finding I ended up finding one other who had a WebMD page, um, but it's uh, it's not the it's not the first time I've had the, I've had these sort of interesting um, experiences. Coincidences, yeah. Um, sure. I when I in my young in my younger days I when the first time I was in Europe when so, when somebody looked at my la, my actual last name and they asked me if I had in relation to Mirko Krokop. Hmm. I don't. I wish I did. I wish I had his kicking abilities, but I don't. <laughs> well, Prokop and Proctor aren't that far removed from one another, really. We're yeah. probably shirt shirt tail cousins. Yeah. You know, given so, given all the insanity that hap <clears throat> that happens in the Midwest, I'd be perfectly willing to believe it. And I come out of the insanity of the Midwest because I was born in Goshen, Indiana. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm of Amish and Irish ancestry. I'm a Yoder on my mother's side. You can't get much more Amish than that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I miss my relatives so very much. Yeah. And, and uh, the, the, my whole story is in a book that's out there that people are still buying, believe it or not, mm -hmm. called Where's My Fortune Cookie? Okay, you can get it on Amazon. And uh, it tells the story of my background and then how I got into this crazy business. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm 81 years old now, and I started as a child actor when I was about, I guess, 11, mm -hmm. maybe 12, back in New York on live television. And uh, now I'm on dead television, because everybody I know is, is, is going away. But I'm still here, and, I, and I'm glad I get a chance to talk to exciting younger people like you. Mm -hmm. You're like, like what, you're 58? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm 33. Oh, good. Well, that's a good year because you can look forward and you can look backward. <clears throat> the same with 22, 44, 55, etc. Um, I've always, I've always felt it would really suck if, you, if someone's birthday was on February 29th. Because, yeah, because it doesn't exist, right? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. You'd have to be about your age before you can finally start buying beer. I see. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm July 28, 1940, mm -hmm. and happy to be here to yeah. tell you about it. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I usually start with the, I usually start with the humble beginnings as a bit of tradition around here. Now wait a minute, your humble beginnings or mine? Well, obviously not mine. That's that'd be redundant. <laughs> well, I don't have any humble beginnings. <laughs> But I, when I was when I was a baby, <clears throat> in my in my uh, grandfather's <laughs> arms, he, back in Goshen, Indiana, he was he was singing a, a hymn to me because you know we're well we're Amish, okay, uh, and, okay. Uh, and and Irish, you know. So yeah. he was singing the mass. No, he was singing a hymn to me, and I hummed it back. You know, I was a little baby, okay. and so he took me downstairs, and and I repeated it for the family, which, by the way is the last time I ever worked free. 
Okay. <laughs> so I was born with like a tape recorder in my head. Uh, I was born with a natural musical uh, ability. My entire family harmonized and sang together. And my great uncle, Joe Yoder, who wrote the history of our family called Rosanna's Boys, uh, uh, pardon me, called uh, Rosanna of the Amish, which is in its, I think, 200th paperback printing in, a, in Mennonite presses everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. He had these abilities. He had <clears throat> linguistic ability. I speak seven languages. He had a musical ability. I've always been able to sing and, uh, and play the violin and things like that. And he had, uh, he was a lecturer mm -hmm. and a writer and you know, an actor as well. He was in minstrel shows when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. So I really feel that genetically I got a big dose of whatever it was that, that he ended up with. And, uh, and, I, and I've been taking advantage of it ever since. <laughs> yeah, obviously I, did. I um I wasn't intending on going on going on going that far back into hum, into um, humble beginnings. I was. Well, do you want to talk about my my, my life previously? I was a, <laughs> I was I was a Roman uh, a citizen, and I <laughs> I freed my slaves, and I was thrown to the lions because of it. <laughs> okay. Talk about games. <laughs> oh, no, but I, of course it do, it doesn't exactly help that I that I've that I seem to be I seem to be gathering a a small amount of Italians in, into the into the temple in the last two years. So, a veri, a vero, eh? So perché? I don't I don't know I don't know if I'm, if if a bunch of them ended up end up in togas I'm walking out. Um, okay. <laughs> But <laughs> no sheet. It, yeah, no sheet. <laughs> no sheet. Um, I've already, I've already seen, I've already seen Caligula enough times to know what, to know what happens with enough, to with oh. enough togas and enough time. My favorite senator. <laughs> I mean, se no, pardon me. My favorite uh, Caesar. I mean, he, he, he put a horse in the Senate, which is why I, I said, which is you know, n nothing new. Now we have nothing but asses in there. So you know, what's the big deal? Yeah, I always I always oh. remember that movie for the giant boat. Yes, yes, I of course don't remember that uh, because it was a miniature. Mm -hmm. All right, and see, I, I'm in show business, mm -hmm. so I know that that giant boat was a miniature. Okay, so I it, I was not impressed. Oh, <laughs> uh, I think I remember the mantra being: if you need something really, really big, you build it really, really small. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. To which Star Wars? Uh, well, I, I remember. I remember at one point seeing the model for the ship from Close Encounters, and the thing. Yeah. Probably, I'd say the thing goes up to my knee, but that's not. But that's not saying much because of no. because of the fact that I'm. I have tall guy problems. I see. <laughs> okay. I'm Luckily, six, you're sitting six. down right now. You're mm -hmm. sitting down. See. Okay. You're six six and thirty three. Mm -hmm. See. I see a kind of a. Uh, th there's there's something going on karmically here, <laughs> or comically. I'm not sure which it is. Probably both. But yeah, but yes. And of course now with all this CGI, uh, it's really hard to know anymore how many miniatures are actually involved, or whether it's all been created by uh, brilliant CGI artists. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's kind of fun to watch the old movies now, and and when you see like. 10,000 people, you know that there really were 10,000 extras, you know, like they called up the mm -hmm. army to be in this scene, mm -hmm. you know, whereas now you, 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 you can't believe your eyes anymore. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I, fi I find my love, my love of science fiction ha has, pr has produced an interesting relationship when it comes to how how to try and do science fiction in um, film? Um, yeah, I think one of the fav one of my favorite unfortunate stories in that regard is all is all the trouble that happened with the RoboCop suit in the first yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is first off that thing is like eighty pounds. Yep. Second, they they got a guy who was sli who was slimmer. Um. And. To make it to make it even worse, even though the film is set, in, this is supposed to be set in Detroit. They were filming in Dallas. 
in ah, the summer. The part of Detroit, the t- part of Detroit was played by Dallas in the summer. Oh boy. <laughs> yes. Good luck. Woo. And to well, make you know even, my to make yeah, it go even ahead. worse as if it's not bad enough with that already. Um he was being trained in mime for slow movements. Oh. <laughs> sure. Well, you know, I I am uh, featured mm-hmm. in a film called was which was called Robo Chick. Mm-hmm. Okay? And they had to change the name to Cyber Chick because the robo cop people uh, sued them or said they were going to sue them. Mm-hmm. So I'm in Cyber Chick. <laughs> but but Cyber Chick has a lot of nudity in it. So you don't have to worry about, you know, 20, 80 pound costumes. Of course, my favorite science fiction story about that is the, the day the earth stood still. Mm-hmm. Okay. The uh, uh, actor who was hired to play Gork, I think it is, or Gord or whatever it is. Gork. Uh, Gork was actually a, a uh, what's, an usher at the uh, Chinese theater, Grauman's Chinese theater. And he was something like seven foot, seven foot three. So the director who had seen him at screenings at the theater immediately said, this is my robot. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just great. You know, they could actually build to his dimensions and he he could handle that, that suit because he filled it. Yeah. You know, it's pretty good. I've never had to be in a robot suit, but I have had to be in. Ar- I've had. I have had to be in armor, and um, jury's out about which one is worse, especially when you're in, when you're out there in the heat. Well, now I, I imagine that. You know, I I don't know if you saw the film The Last Duel, yet. Not have yet. you seen The Last Duel? Oh my God, it's absolutely brilliant. It's a brilliant mm-hmm. movie, uh, and there's a lot of <clears throat> fighting in in. Uh, armored attire Mm -hmm. in it and i'm assuming of course that it's all light plastic or something made to look like armor which you can do now but the the fact of the matter is the duel is based on a true story Mm -hmm. and the fact of the matter is that the guy who got killed at the end and i won't tell you who he was actually was killed because he fell down and he couldn't get up Mm -hmm. okay that was that was one of the hazards of fighting when you were wearing heavy armor. Yeah, pretty pretty much cuz especially if you depending on the type of armor, you're get, you're going to have more or less mobility. Um yeah. but if you if you're in if you're in full plate, like we're ta- we're talking we're talking full plate, there's not there's not a single exposed jo- joint at all. Wow. You get you get knocked down, it's gonna, it's going to take some work to get back up. That's right. That's right. And some of them just couldn't. They fell on their back. It was like a turtle falling on his front. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get the idea. Yeah. He was, like, he was like a turtle on a fence post. No, yeah. that metaphor doesn't work either. But anyway, he was a dead duck. There you go. That managed to put an animal into it. Yeah. <laughs> he um, was skewered mm-hmm. like a duck. Okay, yeah. good. Um, but... I don't know. I don't know if they had if they had used real armor or not, or real armor or not. I, with a lot of with a lot of those kind with a lot of those kind of films, I think I think that using pla- using plastic, um, isn't done as much. But I, I really don't know. And why were you in armor? Um, I was. It was it was my SCA days. What does that mean, SCA? Um, SCA is Society for for Creative and Act. Um, oh, reenactments. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was okay. do- I was doing that kind of thing. Um, some of the people there really didn't like me because I kept because I kept calling out I kept calling out their crap whenever whenever they'd get on me for for um not for <laughs> for not for not, for not using the, for not using the sword the quote unquote right way. Oh right, yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. Or or the whole you have to, if you're going to be a knight, you have to do you have to do sword and shield. And I was there, and I was walking around with a mace. <laughs> um, there's there's well, you walk, you walked around with a mace because you could just spray them. Not in, that in ca- their, not that kind uh, of mace. No, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Although very very clever. Yeah. Um, so you were kind of mixing mixing Dungeons and Dragons. With a reenactment of a of a medieval sword fight, right? Um, 
Well, the two the two of them are the two of them are are extremely joined at the hip as somebody who's I was I obviously wasn't there for the earliest of days, but um, where I come the part of Minnesota that I come from has a very illustrious history when it comes to the founding days of Dungeons and Dragons. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of that is de a lot of that is detailed in the document in the documentary Secrets of Blackmore. Okay. Oh. Now, I, I do have to tell you also mm -hmm. that my Ur group, the Firesign Theater, mm -hmm. which for those of you who do, are too young to know, uh, is, was a four-man satirical comedy group that basically wrote, uh, created long-form comedy albums, okay? And uh, we had quite a long career. There were two of us still alive, Dave Osman and myself, Peter Bergman, who kind of founded the group, and Phil Austin, who was an early producer of uh, Peter's radio show, Radio Free Oz, where we all got together. He also passed away. But when we were working together in the, I guess it was the 80s, uh, late eight, 70s or early 80s, we were hired to create a prototype for an interactive game mm -hmm. before they existed. And what we were called upon to do was to write a piece, which we called Eat or Be Eaten, mm -hmm. and to uh, put it into a CD with clues that would lead you from one episode to the next in the proper order. And they embedded pictures of us for each episode mm -hmm. to, okay, they, they was, the uh, technology was not sophisticated enough to put in live action, mm -hmm. but we had a, a big photo session with all these different costumes and everything, and it was done for Sony in Japan, mm -hmm. and out of that research came the uh, belief that they could indeed make interactive CDs and other forms of, of games, and the games evolved from it. Mm -hmm. I also did a voice in the very first interactive game ever created. Do you know what it was called? I, be I believe it was called Bomb Squad, which is you got it. You got it. Trying, trying to, trying to, trying to dig up Bomb Squad in game in game form is very is very difficult to do research on because you end up getting a bunch of false positives. Yeah, I can I can imagine. Well, both Phil Austin and I mm -hmm. did the voices for that game, and of course, <clears throat> the voices at that point, we had to say separate words, and the machine put them together. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to say something like, "I'm going to drop a bomb. Mm -hmm. I'm going to drop a bomb," and then they could use those words in different combinations. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, drop a bomb, mm -hmm. or I'm going, I'm out of here. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was, it was bits of, of, uh, of, of our voice. And, of course, that's become tremendously sophisticated now. Anybody with a GPS knows that they say, uh, recalculation, stop and make a legal U-turn. Mm -hmm. You know, you are on Sapavada Street. Mm -hmm. Turn right on. Deck snack. You know? <laughs> yeah. What I find in, what I find interesting about a pro about a project like that and the time that it, the time that it was coming about is around that around that time one th one thing that I I remember I remember seeing in my re in my research that was really it was really making waves was this idea of mixing video with um, board games. The whole VHS board game was starting right. was starting to catch on around that time. Right, and it. Unfortunately, that kind of, that kind of thing didn't really stick. Although the probably the most gloriously cheesy um, version of that was the Dragon Strike board game. Yeah, <laughs> which uh, the was and it was an attempt to try and teach board game audiences how to play. At the time, it was Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. Um, it didn't really catch on, but there, but um. Pe but people up uh, people uploaded the full contents of the VHS and it is a glorious slice of cheese. I'll bet. <laughs> I'll bet. Now, of course, of course, there. When I started playing those games, mm -hmm. it was all computer typing. Mm -hmm. Remember that? It was really yep. very awkward. 
pick, I, I pick up the sword and the bag of gold and I walk over the bridge towards the fire. Well, you know, one of the games you pl- are you familiar with um, Zork? No, I'm not that familiar with games, to be honest with you. Yeah. Although I admire them, I admire their creators, obviously, because mm-hmm. they gave me a lot of employment over the years. <laughs> but I do remember, you know, uh, being intrigued enough. I'll, I'll tell you one thing. Do you remember the game, the, the, actually, the very beautiful interactive game, Mist? Yes. Which I think was a real breakthrough. It well, was. my my late partner Peter Bergman and I wrote a parody of that called Pissed, <laughs> P Y S D, mm-hmm. and and we recreated uh, a lot of the elements of the game. But the the joke was that so many people have played the game that they trashed the island. Okay. <laughs> And, and there's all there's empty beer cans and litter and you know scattered all over the landscape, and we got our dear friend John Goodman to play the king mm-hmm. in it, and it, that was a heck of a lot of fun mm-hmm. to do that, you know. Yeah, um, I, br- I bring up Zork because that's con- that's considered one of the one of the earliest examples of that sort of that sort of interactive game that especially involved typing. Yeah. And, that would, although um, although there, there, it's arguable that there's early examples like the like the D and D attempt with the that tried to use the plate the old Plato um engines back in the seventies. Oh boy. Oh. Oh boy. <laughs> which, it which could which was could be argue, could be argued to be a, to be a bit um a bit actually quite bleeding edge for its time. Since bleeding the, edge. I love. Like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's that's sharp. But tell me something. Yeah. Uh, when when did you get uh, interested in the gaming world, and how long have you been doing researching it and doing this show, etc.? Um, now I've only I've only been doing m- this particular this particular channel since I start I started my channel in about two thousand two thousand seven. I want to say. Okay. Um, and I had gone. I had gone through several ideas that that none of them stu- none of them stood out. But about about um seven years ago, is when I started doing re- when I started doing reviews. And initially, my goal was to solely do reviews on role playing games outside of Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. Because stuff like Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and the like, those are the. the I wanted to focus less on the big names and more on the names that. A lot of people weren't talking about. I've kind of had that whole hidden gems attitude, even when I was a kid, um, going through going through whole libraries from oh, from opening to closing. In fact, there's one library where I where I ended up reading so much I ended up getting a spare set of keys from the guy running the place. Oh wow! Because well, I was in there pretty much every every day until and on week and on weekends in there from from noon to 10 p.m. just reading. And he was like, "You're in here so much, I may as well get you a spare set of keys." And I just brushed it <laughs> off because I didn't think he would actually do it. Flash, flash forward to a week later, where he does it and, sa- and says, "Don't burn the place down while I'm while I'm not here." Yeah, yeah. we we actually Fireside Theater wrote a parody mm-hmm. uh, of games mm-hmm. and game players called "The Pink Motel mm-hmm. Burns Down." <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think it's still available on Mars or something. I don't know yeah. where you can get it, but. Okay, I, that's amazing. But that's in, amazing. But when it comes, but games in one form or another have been have been a, have been a part of my life ever since I was a little kid. I um, can imagine, right? Like my fir- my my earliest memories is is with is with the old floppy disks with the Apple II GS. Oh at boy! The time. Wow! And I did. I I am from I am familiar with stuff like the Atari and the in television, but obviously those predated me. Sure. Um, as well as the many 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 Pong games. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. But if I if I were to do a documentary try, trying to catalog them all, I'm pretty sure my editor would shoot me. <laughs> but the but seeing seeing. But after after playing games after playing games a lot and 
try, trying to trying to make my own and tr and getting an understanding of mm. of these systems within it, whether it be whether it be board games, whether it be whether it be role playing games, or whether it be video games. Um, I've always had a fascination for understanding how some how something works and the process to get to that point. Um, whether I, I suppose an early example of that that's not game related that I was fascinated by is all the failed attempts to try and actually get a plane to fly. Hmm. Until mm. we, until until the Kitty Hawk flyer um, eventually was eventually was able to make it work, yep. and some of those ridiculous ideas ended up being the birth pl the birthplace for the Flugtag event. Oh right, right. Which is a interesting, yeah, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of I'll, fun, I'll, but I'll, I'm never gonna do it. <laughs> no, no, no. But at least they're not jumping off the Eiffel Tower. They're no. just going into the into the water. You know. <laughs> no, that's a bit. That's a bit much. I, I learned my lesson. Th I learned my lesson a long time ago when I tr when I tried cannonballing off the high dive in in Ooh. grade school. Ooh, Ooh. Um, it's a miracle it, I didn't break my tailbone. It's better to do it virtually than in reality, frankly. <laughs> you know. Now, are you are you? I hesitate to even ask this question, but do you have a family? Are you married? I'm not married. I do. I do have. I do have, of course, my extended family, including all my cousins, and all and all of them are as much of a troublemaker as me. Yep, very Midwestern. Um, <laughs> I did too. Yep. Um, I am the every year. Every year, I have to be reminded of the of the fact that I am banned from the kitchen during Thanksgiving. <laughs> you turkey. <laughs> well, what happened was. One year for one year during a birthday party, someone thought it would be really funny to use trick candles on the cake. Yeah, sure. And I was I was the only one not laughing because I didn't find it funny. And I I looked at everybody and I'm like, I'm gonna get you all for this. You thought it was a mean prank or something? I th yeah, I thought I thought so, I thought somebody I thought somebody was trying to screw with me th at the time. Oh, and, sure. And um. A, a lot of people just laughed it off, thinking that I wasn't thinking that I was I wasn't gonna do anything in revenge or something like that. Yeah. Well, flash forward about two years, and bef into the interim, I end up making a mis I end up making a mistake at a buf at an old country buffet, where I thought I had grabbed cranberry sauce and instead I grabbed beets. And then when I made okay. after I made that mistake, I started smiling because I just got a wonderful, awful idea. Uh oh. So when nobody was paying attention when they were set when they were setting things up, I switched the jellied cranberry sauce for sliced red beets, <laughs> and nobody knew until everybody started eating. Ah, good one. <laughs> and everybody just, um, and everybody is of course is of course is of course doing spit takes, and I'm I'm just sitting there laughing while I'm at, while I'm having my while I'm having my plate, and. Everybody turn. Everybody turns at me and go and just goes, "What? Did, what did you do? What like, did you do? Like, you. I told you I was gonna get you." <laughs> <laughs> what revenge is a dish better served cold, yes. right? Yeah, and it is very cold. <laughs> and in you Minnesota. and you, and you literally did serve a cold dish for yeah. your revenge. <laughs> I um, practical jokes are is something that I try and elevate to an art because. Everybody does the hand in warm water or the shaving cream, that kind of stuff. That's amateur hour. Yeah, I've d I've lost count on how many times I've done it. I prefer doing the things that are so ridiculously insane you would have to be actually insane to try and think about trying them. Ooh. Um. I well, you are. <laughs> I, I yeah. I think you just hit the nail on your head. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, well, give, well, given the given the massive library of of RPG books that I ha that I have in the back, yeah, 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 um, right. But I've done I've done the thing. One of them gets one of one of them was an office prank that got so bad I was banned from the coffee machine. Oh dear, <laughs> what was that? What did you do there? Um, well, the thing, a bit of background on this. I have a chocolate allergy. I can't have I can't have chocolate at all. Well, give it to me. <laughs> I usually, anytime I, anytime I get chocolate, I, I usually for <laughs> Halloween or the like, I'll just, I'll just give it out to my, to my friends. Um, 
But one one day on my birthday, I come into work and there was a chocolate cake sitting on my desk. Hmm. And I knew exact and they and they left a happy birthday card with their name on it, and I knew exactly who it was. Mm. And some people have have asked if this was a if this was an accidental thing. It wasn't. <laughs> this what this was. I was I was at this particular place for about three years by this point, so everybody knew about my issue. It was a malicious statement, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I so fortunately. I knew where the beans were, I knew where the grinder was, and I knew where the backups were when it came to all the add-ons for coffee. You know, the usual okay. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I waited until the right opportunity came. And I, t- I switched out the beans and the ground-up coffee with decaf on both fronts. I switched out all the sugar with salt. Oh. I switched out the powdered creamer with flour. Whoa. I switched out the liquid creamer with coconut water. Mm. And delicious. <laughs> delicious. That's the way I have my coffee every morning. <laughs> but it's an infusion, you see, so I don't really have to taste it. Mm-hmm. My god. Did your birthday cake say, did your cake say happy death day on it? Was no, pre- no, it's, no, no. <laughs> no, it said it said it said happy birthday you damn giant. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, because you're you're six feet uh, six. Ah, uh-huh. okay. And that's something I don't have to worry <laughs> about. <laughs> yeah, be a lot of people. A lot of people tell me that tell me that. Oh, I wish I wish I was as tall as you. No, you don't. You don't want to. Yeah, you don't want to have yeah. to go go into a whole other township just to find clothes that can fit or br- or have three exit signs that you've broken off of your head. Yeah, and I imagine driving is difficult. What car? What kind of car do you have? Um. Because I I can't drive, um, and it's there's a couple reasons. One, everybody around here drives stick, and I'm left-handed. And two, um, huh. I had I had a bit of an incident with in a uh, snowball fight, and it messed with my eyes. Oh, I'm I'm sympathetic because I have macular degeneration, and of course, and you know it, it's it's a bitch to have anything wrong with your vision. But you have to learn to live with it, which I'm sure you have. Yeah. Um, what happened was like what happened was I got white I got whitewashed in a snowball fight with my cousins, and my eyes didn't close fast enough. Ah, oh, too bad. That's that's a shame. Yeah. So all the, all that ice got all that ice just scratched up on my eye. Ouch. Ooh. Well. That's really happy. Let's get back to some games. <laughs> yeah. Where, you, can, where you, can, you can get killed and, and live to see another day. Yeah, well, okay? on, <laughs> you know, on, on that, um, one, thing, one, thing I did, one thing I did want to ask is you've, you've done a lot of voice work when it, comes to ga- when it comes to games. And a thing I'm yeah. curious about is the, trans- the transition between – between doing stage work and doing um, voice acting, mm-hmm. um, what were some of the mm-hmm. habits that you had to kind of unlearn in that process? All right, uh, I have a very strange career, and I've done a little bit of everything. My nickname is the Total Tool. Uh, <laughs> I think, by the way, most of your listeners or viewers or whatever they're doing. Uh, might know me best as Howard in the Rugrats, mm-hmm. which I did for 14 years, mm-hmm. and yeah. the drunken French monkey in the <laughs> Dr. Doolittle movies. <laughs> I'm a social drinker. And I've done scores of Disney pictures, mm-hmm. Pixar movies, uh, and and they are all very theatrical. Mm-hmm. Okay? So the transition from stage acting or musical comedy or whatever to to <clears throat> cartoon work is probably the easiest one to make, Mm -hmm. okay? Because you're emoting, you're creating a character, and you're interacting with other characters. For instance, uh, I was King Gerard on the Smurfs Mm -hmm. back in the Hanna-Barbera days, and the way that they would do that cartoon was that all of the actors would be in the studio. So I'd walk in, and there'd be Jonathan Winters, and uh, oh, I I can't remember all their names, Mm -hmm. great people that I really admired, and we would do the show as if it was a radio show, Mm -hmm. okay? And then we'd do pickups. Now, 
<clears throat> most cartoons and, and almost all animated work for films is done with you alone, and then you are mixed with the other actor, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, rarely do you get to work with another actor, uh, which is great and better. And, e and even when you do that, you, you, there are certain rules. You can't talk over one another, for instance. Mm -hmm. So if, it's, if the characters are talking over one another, you do your line, stop. The other person does their line, stop. And then the mixers will put them together. Mm -hmm. Now, I, my entire career was before uh, I got into the voiceover work, as you rightly said, it was stage work. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Yale, <clears throat> and I, uh, well, I did, I did theater work uh, at Allen Stevenson School in New York, where every year they do a Gilbert, and, we, they still do, a Gilbert and Sullivan production, mm -hmm. and I was a boy soprano, so I played the female roles. I was Mabel in The Pirates of Penzance, Phyllis and Iolanthe, and so I was already using my voice in unusual ways, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when I got into uh, uh, high school, I did many musicals, which again is learning to use your voice and, and to control your voice and to use it properly so you don't strain yourself or tire yourself out. Mm -hmm. So when I got to New York, uh, finally, uh, uh, I did one voiceover job for the first time for a documentary about the Second World War. And uh, and I was playing a German, no, a Russian soldier talking about Hitler's attack on Stalingrad. Mm -hmm. And so, and I did, I speak Russian. I had studied Russian. I had been to the Soviet Union with the Yale Russian chorus singing in Russian. Mm -hmm. Hey! And, and so, I could do that. I could speak in a dialect and make it sound like it was a Russian guy, you know? Mm -hmm. And at the end of that session, I remember signing my contract and I had made $365 for an hour's work. And something in my head went, boing! This, this might be an area of the business you should pursue. OK, but I didn't get any other opportunities to do that until I got out to here to Los Angeles uh, and connected up with my friend Peter Bergman, who was on KPFK radio doing Radio Free Oz. And one of the, the gimmicks of that show was that Peter, who was the wizard, would be interviewing various people. And sometimes we made up those people. We became those people. Mm -hmm. So maybe we were, I was a French filmmaker mm -hmm. who was part of the Oz Film Festival, you know? Mm -hmm. Or I was a, you know, a Mexican guy who was selling tacos uh, down in the lobby, you know? With all these different characters. And again, it was a, an opportunity for me to use my linguistic abilities, my ear, and my comic chops to create funny characters. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, when the Firesign Theater started making records, and in which I could do ultimately hundreds and hundreds of voices and create my own characters, like Ralph Spoilsport, the, the used car salesman. Hiya friends, Ralph Spoilsport, the world's largest used nude and nude lewd automobile dealership, Ralph Spoilsport Motors here in the city of emphysema. Things like that. And, and ultimately, I said to myself, I got to exploit this, you know, some way. And there, were, there was a commercial world that was going on. Voiceovers in radio at that time, very big, very big business. Mm -hmm. So I put together a voice tape with the help of Fred Jones, our dear, one, one of our dear, wonderful engineers, genius, who got it, finally had his own studio that we did a lot of our records in. And, uh, uh, and I, I, I did a tape, and I sent it to various agents. I was already a SAG actor, because I had done a film called Sunday in New York, where I had a, a, a silent bit with Jane Fonda, mm -hmm. okay? And so I was a member of, of the Screen Actors Guild. And the way I got into the Screen Actors Guild, my uncle, Clarence Urist, was a production assistant on major movies. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And so, and he also, by the way, did all the second unit stuff for Abbott and Costello's television show. <laughs> all right, so he had his hand in a lot of different projects. <clears throat> he worked, <clears throat> he did a lot of James, John Wayne movies, for instance, and that's what killed him because he did Genghis Khan, which they shot on a, uh, a, a irradiated test field in Nevada or someplace where they had, you know, been testing atomic bombs. And so, because it was a desert, <clears throat> it was a desert setting, and Genghis Khan, played by John Wayne, don't, don't ask, was, you know, a desert dweller. Mm-hmm. So they shot for a couple of months out there, and then they drove tons of this earth back to the sound stage so that they could recreate the look of the set. So all the people who worked on that movie were irradiated and died of various uh, 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 reactions to radio, radioactive poison. My uncle died of, you know, like a liver cancer. John Wayne died of a similar thing. And it's, it's really quite a scandalous story in Hollywood. But in any event, uh, I, in order to get my SAG card to do this movie, which my uncle got me a reading for, I had to be in the union. So he took me over right after I was cast in the film, which was that very day. He took me over to a Rockefeller Plaza, and I went up to where they did the news live, which well, they still do. So they were doing the news live, <clears throat> and he had me you point at a... I was in a, a live commercial, is what I to cut to the chase. And all I had to do was point at a princess telephone. They were introducing, I don't know if you remember princess telephones. They lit up. Mm-hmm. Okay, it was, it was a revolutionary new concept of a home phone. So I got my after card by fingering a princess, and that allowed me to get my SAG card. So... I could get an agent. <clears throat> you have to have an agent if you're going to do any kind of commercial or regular voice work. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I put together my tape. I got an agent, uh, Abrams, Rubeloff, and Lawrence, and they started sending me out on readings, and I started getting work mm-hmm. because I knew how to use my voice and do you know uh, whatever was called for in the copy. And I got cartoon work, and my my career as a voiceover artist beyond the Firesign Theater took off. At the same time, Firesign Theater was being nominated for Grammys for the best comedy albums, and we had we did radio shows galore for for a decade. We did radio shows on various stations. We syndicated radio shows. So I was working with my voice all the time and occasionally I'd get a stage job and I could do that and the voice work that I'd done informed my stage work and the stage work that I did informed my vocal work okay because they all I was using the same instrument in different ways now when the games came about Mm -hmm. it became much more popular especially the all the war games I was very busy because I speak seven languages and I can fake others. So I could go in and do a a German soldier, a French soldier, Italian soldier, Spanish soldier, uh, uh, guerrilla, actually Spanish guerrilla, Norwegian, uh, you name it. I could, and English, all kinds of different dialects and things like that. I could do all of that. So I got cast a lot. That then led to what we call looping and dubbing or ADR work mm-hmm. which is ad, you know adding voices to television shows and movies background voices or revoicing characters either using a variation of your voice that matched the look of the character or matching the char- the star's voice because he was not available to reloop or redub or add a new line to the film that he'd done. Mm -hmm. And that career lasted for something like 30, maybe 40 years, because I could go in, uh, the the looping uh, casting directors 
the head of the loop group basically would call would call me up and say uh phil this takes place in brooklyn russia uh china and uh london and new york Mm -hmm. can you do all that yeah sure i can do all that and i did Mm -hmm. and 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 i'm working with also also wonderfully talented people with who could improvise uh, which is the way that we did all of that, improvise dialogue and conversation and and also replace voices if we had to. And I tell you, that was a lot of fun. And, and the thing that was so great about that was not only did we get a day's session fee for eight hours of pretty hard work, but we would also, we still get residuals from that work. Anytime there was an ancillary usage of a film or a television show or a cartoon or whatever it was that I added a voice to, I get a check. Now, in the case of Rugrats, Mm -hmm. because we did 14 years of it, but we never went into a network, it was always Nickelodeon, I get checks for Mm $3.18, $0.17, $0.17, $0.17, $0.17, $0.17, or minus one, okay? Because, because people are now downloading these episodes and they, they pay bupkis. The reason I bring this up is the gaming world makes billions and billions of dollars. But we as voice actors have tried unsuccessfully for years to get a residual for the work that we do on these games. Mm-hmm. And we have been totally unsuccessful in achieving that. So what happens in the game world is that if you are a major character, like I was Dr. Vidic in, uh, in, you know, in uh, Assassin's Creed, uh, I forget the name, Aspergo wants you, uh, I I would get triple scale, quadruple scale for my session, which was kind of like saying, okay, you don't get a residual, but we'll pay you a little more for the work that you're doing. And that's that's still where we are. It's okay. It's what it is. But I I still think one day there should be a residual return for actors on on these games. Mm-hmm. That's that's just another aside about it. So, in answer to your question, one talent informs another talent. Mm-hmm. If you are flexible enough and open enough to be able to experiment with yourself and improvise with yourself you know there are many times people uh will tell other uh, will say to somebody boy you've got a great voice you really should go into commercials or voiceover and it's very possible that they have a really great voice mm-hmm. and it's very possible they can make a really great career using it mm-hmm. but they are up against all these other people with really great voices Whereas somebody like me, being a character voice actor, is have have much more opportunities to express my talent and to be cast. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And since you brought since you brought up um, accents, that is that is something that I that I want that I want to get into now. Obviously, you have a bit you have a bit of an advantage being a being a bit of a um, polygot. You know, speaking a polyglot a, and a polyglot. and a ham. I'm a polyglot <laughs> and I'm a ham, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh. The sad. Th- the sad thing is, I can't even say you're the you're the biggest ham I've had in the temple. Oh, okay. I'm just a glazed ham. <laughs> <laughs> There's a so joke anyway. you can make about that about that, but it's too easy. But- okay. <laughs> Especially with both of us having eye problems. You know, <laughs> yeah. glazed eyes. But. Enough. But, On we go. Yeah. <laughs> but what I was what I was curious about is is um adapt adapting to to an act to an accent that at that at the time you had ta- at the time you had taken a role may not have been as familiar. How you prepared yourself on that front? Okay, uh, same with languages. Mm-hmm. I do not speak Vietnamese. I do not speak Chinese. Only a little bit. Mm-hmm. Don't speak Japanese. I don't speak Arabic. But when you go into a session, or when I would go into an ADR session, they usually would have a native speaker there 
to guide us through it. And it was our responsibility before computers, before uh, 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 phones, you know, where you can reach things instantly in your hand. Before that, we all had to do individual research on the languages that we had to speak. Mm -hmm. And we would go online uh, and, and get phrases that we could use, okay? Carry the pieces of paper into the, uh, the recording studio, or in the case of movie studios, they were big, big rooms with a screen, a big screen, and, and, and read off of those. So uh, I discovered, again, because of, of my unique ability, mm -hmm. that if I was speaking Chinese, had to mimic Chinese, and, and I had a native speaker, and they say it once, I could say it, and they say, you Chinese? I go, no, I don't speak Chinese. Say, you have a good accent. You speak Chinese. And that made me very happy. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the way that, you know, that I, I remember I, we did this one film, The Passion of Christ, which is, you know, quite a big success, <clears throat> which they shot at uh, uh, a town. What was that town called, honey? Moderna. Uh, Moderna. Moderna. No, no, Modena. No, Modena in Italy, mm -hmm. which is one of the no. oldest cities. No. No, Matera. Okay, here it is. Matera. My darling wife, who is my thumb drive and my memory in my old age, it's a town called Matera. Mm -hmm. Matera. And it, it, it is such an old town that there are caves that people lived in in the Bronze Age that you can still go and visit. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they shot the Passion of the Christ there. In the recording sessions for this movie, we had to speak Aramaic and Latin, mm -hmm. okay? <clears throat> what was particularly funny about that was that Christ would be reviled in one pass in Aramaic or Latin, you know. You're a boob, you're a fake, you're a fake god, you know, kill, you should be killed in Aramaic, okay? And then it's the same in Latin. And then we'd have to do another pass where it was, Lord, our Savior, we love you. You know, P please, please be careful. You don't do anything wrong to draw attention to yourself in Aramaic. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, but it's not the kind of a la language that I, I could then say, oh, I got to learn this one. You know, this, this, I mean, I'm teaching myself Vietnamese now because I get my nails done in nail salons and they're all run by Vietnamese. They all, you know, all of the all of the lovely people who do it are mm -hmm. Vietnamese, right? So uh, I can say things now like, uh, uh, see if I can remember some of them. Oh, uh, hello, uh, thank you is, uh, oh dear God, what is thank you now? Well, anyway, come on, come on. Oh yeah, come on. Thank you is come on. <laughs> come on, let me thank you. And various things. Every time I try to learn a new phrase so I can say, hello, you know, how much do I owe you? Thank you. That's good. You know, shorter, please. You know, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so it, it's for me, it's it's a non ending mm -hmm. kind of an adventure, even if I'm not working the way I used to all the time. Mm -hmm. I still am fascinated by language and the uses of it. And since it's a, a skill that I have. Uh, it comes naturally to me. It's fun. It's like, you know, an, a, a constant hobby mm -hmm. for me. Now, of course, the tough part <clears throat> of doing <clears throat> a lot of voices in uh, uh, games is that you're often called upon to scream and die in unique ways. Mm -hmm. And they save that till the end of a session. You probably have interviewed some other people who've told you about this. <laughs> okay. But at the end of a session, <clears throat> I say, <clears throat> okay, Phil. <clears throat> clear your throat now you're going to uh you're going to be you're, you're going to be set on fire and pushed off a cliff okay so I, <laughs> okay now you you're run through with a sword and uh, and then uh, a flaming arrow uh, is shot into your back and you fall into a vat of water and drowned you know and you go like <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have you improvise whatever it is, and then you usually leave those sessions saying, 
thank you very much. That was really fun. I'll do it again sometime. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's called stunt pay. You get a little extra for that. Yeah. That's stunt pay. Mm -hmm. But now tell me, some of the people that you've interviewed uh, over, the, over your years doing this show, mm -hmm. uh, what have you learned uh, that you might want to ask me about to see if it, you know, uh, it jives with what you've heard from the others? Yeah. Um, the next thing I was going, next thing I was going to ask actually is on, um, endurance. Um, yeah. Cause now the, while I, I'm no stranger to acting, but I've, I've only ever done stage and a, and a little bit of, um, film acting and the mm -hmm. film acting I had chosen the worst thing to do because, um, I had, to, I had to do some degree of stunt work. Which is a Whoa. fancy way of saying I got I got I got paid to get the holy hell beat out of me for about five days. Yeah, because you're a big guy, right? Yeah, I'm a I'm a big I'm a big guy, but that doesn't mean but but that doesn't, doesn't mean, mean that you're flexible. I know, well, I know. With the well, with the particular scene I was I was in, I I had um, I think I had gotten I think I gotten hit with about with about a dozen about a dozen wooden bar stools. Um, oh no! Oh no! I got hit with bar stools. I got hit with glass. I had I had to spend about two weeks Can take candy glass. <laughs> no, yeah. it's candy glass, right? Yeah. Oh, it was you can actually yeah. eat it. Um, I wouldn't recommend that. It, no, it was, I wouldn't either. But it was. I have. But um, but just just because it, I li I liken it to the term less lethal. Just because just because it's not going to do any lasting damage doesn't mean it's not going to hurt like hell. That's um, right. And I had, I had, I, I remember when I was done with it, I called, I called my usual work and I said, I'm not coming in. I can barely get out of bed. <laughs> right. Right. So, so that's your question. Well, uh, well, the one thing, the question that I was, the question on endurance is more of the, is, is more on the, uh, is more a reflection of the fact that you're likely in the booth for hours at a time. And yeah. How how do you how do you make sh how do you make sure that you don't completely run your voice dry from the from those long sessions? It, well, it's not it, the voice is not the the thing that that goes. Uh, we're trained to use our voice. Mm -hmm. We can use our diaphragm as we sing. We talk the same way. We can use our diaphragm, mm -hmm. and uh, and we know how to we know how to use our instrument. Mm -hmm. What happens is you can get physically fatigued. Now, for instance. Right now, the job that I'm doing uh, is I just finished a job where I am the cat in the hat in the Dr. Seuss books. Mm -hmm. And next week, I'm going to be the Grinch in the Grinch Who Stole Christmas book. Mm -hmm. And these stories that I'm playing the cat in the hat in are for a game. No, pardon me, a toy mm -hmm. called the Tony Box. And the Tony box is a little box for children, really, with a little speaker, uh, that uh, little holes in the front that look like a little cat's face, and the controls are two little cat's ears on the top. And the gimmick of the game, which makes it so fat, game, game, game. The gimmick of the toy that makes it so fascinating is that it comes with these little figures. So there will be a figure of the toy. Uh, of, of the cat in the hat, and when they put that on top of the box, it will tell the stories, fully produced with music, song, actors, sound effects, foley, and each different character figure that they put there will give you a different story. Now, I had a long, long day doing a bunch of these, in a studio, and the first time that I did it, I stood. And remember, let me remind you, I'm 81 years old, mm -hmm. and I felt that the next day. I felt like I felt beat up, and my lungs—not my lungs, my my ribs, my rib cage—hurt a little bit from all the singing and 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 uh, histrionics I had to do. So the second time, I said, I think I better use a chair this time. And it was much better. But still, your your chest, your lungs, your muscles are being used. And it has a physical effect. Not the voice. The voice is pretty much always there. But fatigue can set in. You're talking about making movies. I've done everything. I've done stage. I've done television. I've done 
uh, film television. I've done live television. I've done three camera comedies. I've done uh, regular feature films uh, as well. And recently I did a feature film again at my age. And the thing that was now difficult for me was that the, when you shoot a film, you shoot a major scene, a first scene, a master scene. Let's say it's you and another actor. You're talking together. It's a two-shot, and you go through the whole scene as best you can. Mm -hmm. Then you do pickups of that. Then the camera moves around, and it just follows me, and I do my lines. Camera moves around, just does the other actor, and he or she does her lines. Then you do close-ups and other angles, and that's where it gets really tiring because you're, you're, you're being asked to physically get into sometimes very unnatural positions, which looks fine for the camera, but is very trying for the actor. And I discovered after the last time I did that, and I, 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 I'd finished, we'd finished the major part of the scenes, and I thought, good, now I can go home. And he said, okay, let's do, let's do the close-ups. And I went, oh my God, I spent another two hours doing all these, these bizarre close-ups. And that was tiring, okay? And it's tiring even for a young person. But uh, everything has a physical aspect to it. And you have to learn, just like an athlete, how to reserve your strength and how to, you know, use your, uh, your, your body in ways that will not exhaust you. When you're doing plays, the mm -hmm. thing that people tend to forget about it is uh, you're doing it over and over and over and over and over again, uh, day after day after day after day. When I first started off Broadway, I did uh, several several wonderful plays uh, off Broadway, and one of them, The Amorous Flea, which was a musical, I won a Theater World Award for, and it's what brought me out to Los Angeles because we moved out, we we went to a theater in Hollywood for a run. We did off Broadway, eight shows a week, mm -hmm. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, two shows back to back Saturday night. This is a musical, mind you, mm -hmm. a Sunday matinee and a Sunday evening. Okay, they served a hot meal between the two shows on Saturday night. Now, when you when you got your day off on Monday you didn't really feel like going out and auditioning for anything else, you know. You just wanted to kind of take a day off. But you learn how to do that, just like an athlete, mm -hmm. okay. Somebody once said to somebody else, Broadway is not for sissies. And it's true. The, when you see the, the energy that actors and actresses express in doing even a dramatic play, you have to respect the fact that, that they are not only uh, talented in interpreting a role, but they've learned how to maintain their strength of purpose through a long run, mm -hmm. okay? Because that's what theater is. And now, I belong to a theater company called the Antius Company, uh, my wife, my dear darling wife, Melinda Peterson, introduced me to them, and we've been in it for 14 years or so. And we do a thing called double casting. So or we did. I don't know if we're going to do it anymore. But uh, that meant that two of two of us would be cast in one role, and that meant that you get half the rehearsal time and half the performances, mm -hmm. and you had to be ready to perform and rehearse in an entirely different way. You had to, because you didn't have the continuity that you get in a normal run of a play. So that I had to learn a new skill. A new, it was a new challenge. And I did. We all did. We learned, we learned to do it. So uh, every job, people always ask me when I do these interviews, what's your favorite, what was your favorite character? And, you know, I could say, oh, the drunken French monkey and Dr. Doolittle, because I could improvise him and he was really funny. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact is, every job I do is my favorite job. Really, because every job is a challenge of some sort or another. 
and an opportunity to play in a different arena. Right now, for instance, with all of this, uh, what do you call it, virtual performing, uh, I've done a couple of things, uh, podcasts and entertaining podcasts, where I did a thing called uh, Cordelia, which is a podcast that you can listen to now. It's a parody of spy dramas. Mm -hmm. And I played the head of the CIA in Western Germany, American. And my session was on a laptop, like I have here now, with uh, the writer and producer in Culver City, with the engineer in San Francisco, and the director in Berlin, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and me here in Beverly Hills, up in the, up in the canyon. And that's a new world. Mm -hmm. That's a new world. Uh, so again, it's kind of a new challenge. It's fun and it's quite different. And a lot of it you do from home. You know, we all have our little microphones now, mm -hmm. professional microphones that we work with. And we do our, all of our auditions from home now. Uh, usually I use GarageBand. Some people use a more sophisticated recording system, but it's just fine. It's done, it's done fine for me uh, to do jobs and auditions. And that's been a new learning curve, mm -hmm. you know, to learn that. And my wife and I have also appeared on camera recreating old-time radio shows for a wonderful producer-director named Greg Oppenheimer, whose name might be familiar to you people who love old radio or mm -hmm. television, because his dad, Jess Oppenheimer, created I Love Lucy, mm -hmm. which started as a radio show, My Favorite Husband. Mm -hmm. Okay, So Greg figured out a way using a system like we're using StreamYard mm -hmm. to record actors recreating old-time radio shows in a way where we could play with one another because we were you know playing in different fields and be re be recorded video recorded and then he cut it all together into a finished show i've done the maltese falcon that way i've done so a jack benny show done several burns and allen shows uh and and this replaced the thing that we used to do, which was to perform, recreate old radio shows at conventions, live at radio conventions in various parts of, of uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. My wife and I have played Nick and Nora in The Thin Man. We did, uh, uh, what's it called? The, Mr. Blanding's Build His Dream House yeah. together uh, as well. And different experience because when you're doing it live before an audience at a convention you got your scripts in your hand you're doing two things you're recreating the program for the audience but you're also recreating the radio show you're using your scripts as actors as perhaps you think they might have done back in 1940 when they did the show originally. All of the commercials, original corny old commercials are in there. The music is in there. The sound effects are in there. You are actually live on stage recreating a radio show. Mm -hmm. I also had the great pleasure of doing uh, a, a recording for four years with a whole bunch of other wonderful actors in a thing called the golden age of radio. Mm -hmm. No, the golden age of pulp fiction, mm -hmm. which you can Google and you'll see. Uh, I did, oh, I don't know, scores and scores of different characters and voices. And they are the short stories of L. Ron Hubbard mm -hmm. before he got involved in all of his Meshuggah Scientology things and all that. Mm -hmm. He was an extremely prolific writer for the pulp uh, pulp uh, books, 
Uh, he, he wrote like over 800 stories. He was cranking them out. And they're wonderfully inventive. There, there's Western horror stories. There's science fiction stories. There's uh, uh, detective stories. There's crime stories. There's World War I stories. There's, World War II. there's Arabian Night stories. There's pirate stories. So you can imagine how much fun it was to be asked to do voices for this particular audio expression. You know, uh, we also participate uh, before the pandemic in a regular Midwestern radio festival called the Here Now Festival, which presents original audio pieces as well as classic recreations. Uh, we also had the great honor of working with Norman Corwin, who was the poet of the golden age of radio and we got to work with him he had a good long life i think he checked out like 101 or something and we worked with him right up to the end a man who created uh, radio drama and radio comedy in ways that had never been done before so you see it it, it is a a widely rewarding business to be in voiceovers if you simply stretch your imagination about what you can do with the, those talents. <clears throat> I do my own podcast mm -hmm. with a friend called Ted Bonnet, and it's called Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. <laughs> and what we do in our show is we, inter we, we interview people who are of the boomer age, who have been through similar experiences and times as we have, and we've interviewed people like Penn, and, Penn Gillette mm -hmm. and uh, Weird Al Yankovic and uh, the ca great character actor Paul Dooley and uh, uh, John Goodman mm -hmm. and, oh, my God. Yeah, if you go to our website, sexyboomershow.com, you'll see that like 28 different people. We're trying now, before the end of the year, to uh, interview Nancy Cartwright, who is the voice of uh, Bart Simpson, and whom I've worked with in Rugrats over the years. Mm -hmm. And we, Lorraine Newman was the last female that we were able to interview. That's a different world. Mm -hmm. Interviewing, as you know, it's a different yeah. thing. You know? and, and you're called upon to improvise, and you're called upon to uh, uh, play in different ways with the people you're interviewing. And, and the other strange thing is that the Firesign Theater is still releasing material. And we just released an album called The Firesign Theater at the Magic Mushroom. I know you don't use pictures, so I'm holding it up mm -hmm. for you to see. This is an 80, uh, uh, 48 page booklet, mm -hmm. profusely illustrated with great pictures and everything, <clears throat> that comes with the CD. And we're taking pre orders of it now at firesigntheater.com. Mm -hmm. We have, over the, the, the decades, released I don't know, maybe 50 albums in various forms and videos and movies. And it's been an extraordinary career. We, we did all this before Monty Python. So we were known as, as the Beatles of comedy and later as America's Monty Python. Uh, our, for those, again, who don't know what the Firesign Theater is, check it out. We're all over the Internet. Firesign Theater. I'm a Leo, two Sagittarians, and an Aries. It's astrological. But we're parodying a show called the Fireside Theater, which used to do various shows on radio in the early days. And as an example of the cultural influence that we had by creating the long-form satirical comedy album, which has sound effects and music and foley and different voices and all kinds of strange surrealistic things, uh, we, we were able to... Uh, uh, we were we were chosen. One of our albums called "Don't Crush That Dwarf, Hand Me the Pliers" was inducted into the Library of Congress. I guess about five six years ago now, mm -hmm. and then more recently, our archives were purchased for six figures by the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a very interesting payoff for a fifty year career, doing you know one very special thing for which all of us sacrificed other aspects of our career in order to participate in. So I have no regrets. Yeah. <laughs> and 
That's I. I cert I can I can certainly I can, I'd say every. I made you speak. <laughs> I made you speechless. <laughs> <laughs> no, all this talk about talking has yeah. made you speechless. <laughs> the the unfortunate problem is sometimes my brain moves faster than my mouth. Oh yeah, always true, always true. Which I think it I think it I think it comes from the I think it comes from the years of pl of playing chess against my old man and I still haven't beat him. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. So, any I, anything anything else you need to know before I I I dive into a drink or something? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I I think I think that I think that covers everything. So, with that in, with that in mind, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to the temple and enjoy the madness at play thank here. Thank you. It's a very magic temple. I like the incense. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's, I, it's my one of my patchouli, one of my favorite things. And you know, what what I went what I was doing before I talked to you was I'm writing a new play, mm -hmm. a satirical comedy based on Shakespeare and Sherlock Holmes, mm -hmm. uh, with my partner Samuel Joseph, and we wrote a play together, called, which was a satirical comedy about politics and religion, mm -hmm. called God Help Us, starring Ed Asner, the late, great Ed Asner as God, mm -hmm. and that play toured the country and Canada before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, see, there's yet another voice that, where, that I, I get to express myself in. Because when I'm writing, I often hear the characters talking in my head. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm informed by all the other things that I've done in, in order to, to, to do writing and directing and producing and anything else. Because mm -hmm. it's really all the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yep. And anytime you see fit to return to my hallowed halls, the door is always open. As we Thank often say you. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure talking at you and, and hearing your own stories. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that very much. So, mm -hmm. yes, indeed, uh, if I'm around, you look out. I may be knocking at the door of your temple once again. <laughs> yeah. All and, right? of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and listen to the insanity at play here. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, <laughs> on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gimming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.